Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Today, we are going to study the application of electron paramagnetic resonance spectroscopy to photochemical research. So, that is photochemistry and EPR. So, what happens when molecules absorb light? molecules are exposed to light, what happens? So, when excited by light, of course, molecule will go to excited state, provided the light is absorbed by the molecule. Now, most of the molecules in the ground state are singlet, all electrons are paired. So, the first excitation usually brings the molecule to the singlet state and from singlet state the molecule can go to triplet state and in triplet state there are two unpaired electrons and you know that unpaired electron means the system is paramagnetic. So, here two electrons are unpaired, so it will be paramagnetic species. So, the triplet can give rise to EPR spectra. Similarly, the excited molecule can undergo chemical reaction and chemical reaction sometimes produces free radical. A free radicals also have unpaired electrons and they are paramagnetic, so they can give rise to EPR spectra. So, we have two types of possibilities one is triplet, other is free radicals, and both can be studied by EPR spectroscopy. But today, we will concentrate on this aspect and not discuss the EPR spectroscopy of triplets. Now, free radicals because they have unpaired electrons usually they are very reactive, they always try to react with something else. So, it is very difficult therefore, to capture them and uh, see their EPR spectrum. So, it is not going to be easy task to capture this thing in the EPR spectrometer. So, it is possible that molecules absorb light and does some photochemistry and they just the spectrometer is not able to detect them. So, then not seeing EPR spectrum does not necessarily mean the reaction is not taking place, but if you do see this thing suppose EPR spectrum is seen. Then there is unambiguous evidence that radical is formed and whatever reaction mechanism one can think of is at least partly supported by the observation of this. What I am trying to say is that if you do not see the, EP, the NEPR spectrum of any radical, it does not mean it is not taking place. So, observation is a definitive proof, not observation is not the proof that it does not happen. So, the, that is why I have written in the slide that if detected they give unambiguous evidence. So, because these are very short lived reactive radicals, how does one really detect them and uh, try to try to capture them even if they are short lived. So, we have to find some way of doing the experiment unlike the examples that you have seen in the APR uh, lectures almost all the radical that we showed are stable reasonably stable radical. So, that you can scan the magnetic field very slowly and get the spectrum radicals do not die during the recording. Here because they are short lived some special techniques need to be adopted. The three ways one can do the experiment here shown in the slide one is that continuous photolysis let the reaction be carried all the time and light is on on the sample and we uh, can hope to get some steady state 
concentration of the radical and that can be seen in a steady state EPS spectrometer. Another possibility is called spin trapping. In this spin trapping technique, this transient radical that is radical which do not live for long time, they react with some other molecule to produce a relatively stable radical. So, this stable radical can be seen in the steady state EPS spectrometer. And third one is called time resolved EPS spectroscopy, where we try to capture the radical as soon as they are created and we will see later how that is done. So, this continuous photolysis. So, here to capture the radical as they are formed, we have to keep on continuing the photolysis and try to record the spectrum. So, how that is done? So, here first I need to sunlight on the sample and this should be done in situ that is we cannot carry the this excitation somewhere else and bring the sample to the spectrometer and hope to get the spectrum that is not possible. So, it has to be done inside the spectrometer to be specific it has to be done inside the micro cavity of the spectrometer. So, how is it carried out? For that here is a uh, design that let us say this is the micro cavity and this is the iris tuning screw. So, we could put a sample tube and let the sample which is kept here reaction mixture can be taken through a pump and this is a low temperature bath and through this liquid goes out here and then again it can be brought back to this reservoir. Now, here there is a hole which is kept here in from the cavity and light can enter through this either laser light or it could even steady state lamp could be inserted here. So, the, remember the cavity looks like this there is an iris hole and this goes to the waveguide here. So, for this end was blocked but we could open a hole here and allow the light to go through, but the trouble is that if you allow light to go through and hole is drill here, the microwave can also leak out of that. So, that will reduce the key of the cavity. So, that is not very desirable. So, what is done here is that some manufacturer instead of opening a hole, they uh, make a grid type of arrangement here. This tiny gaps are kept there. So, that so far as the microwave is concern, concerned, which whose wavelengths are fairly big, they find that this is almost a continuous metal plane. So, it will not escape. So, this is one way of, but the uh, of, uh, allowing the light to go through this, these holes are thin. But the trouble of uh, doing this is that much of the light is not penetrating, so, they are blocked by these grills here. So, another technique is to actually have a hole here and let another piece of small waveguide which is mounted here. So, that the wavelength of uh, this is such that this really cannot sustain within this, this is much smaller dimension this one. So, this almost act like a uh, like a tube which blocks the wave from entering here. So, that way there could be a small uh, slight loss of the cavity cube, but nevertheless this will work very well particularly because the since the hole is clear all the light will go through the micro cavity. And this thermostat uh, arrangement low temperature bath and uh, having the liquid to go through this is to have some control on the temperature because at lower temperature radicals could live for somewhat longer time giving a uh, making it easier to record the EPS spectrum. Another possibility is that here the there is a special tube which is used here which looks like this.
So, uh, sample liquid sample enters here and then comes out and through this it goes out here and this is kept inside a standard variable temperature DOR insert through which cold nitrogen gas is passed through that. So, that sample is cooled by this cold gas here and if you flow this liquid reasonably slowly then it will acquire some sort of steady state temperature uh, which is decided by the flow of this liquid flow of this not liquid nitrogen cold nitrogen gas. And the temperature <laughs> is measured by this heater sensor assembly here and the previous one temperature is measured by the thermocouple here. Here is an example now having um, described how the experiment is done. This experiment involves exciting paravenzoquinone in this and we have sign light and see what happens. So, the light is on all the time. So, the sample is flowing through this and we are recording the steady state EPS spectrum the way we have described earlier. The experiment is very simple now except for this special modification on the cavity and the flow system that is used to uh, continuously replace the sample. So, here signal that is seen here is given in this slide. So, this is triplet, triplet, another triplet, triplet, this triplet, triplet. Overall you can see that this gap is same as this gap. We can now uh, guess that without making any careful measurement. This gap is also same as this gap and this each individual triplet also have similar hyperbolic splitting. And overall this intensity of this and this and this follow 1 is to 2 is to 1. So, that means this radical has one spin that is one proton now I can say proton because the, uh, the chemicals are made up of basically uh, proton uh, 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 magnetic nuclei. So, this gives uh, one proton of one number one another proton which is you now two of them and another one which is 1. So, this gives a triplet that is this 1 is to 2 is to 1. This one gives a doublet. So, this is a mistake because this also gives a triplet. So, this will be triplet. So, this is the type of uh, radical which the radical should have this type of protons. So, here is the structure shown which is consistent with this spectrum and that is so you see that one this is the one proton which gives a double splitting and these and these are equivalent proton so the, so they also give they give rise to a triplet and another proton uh, here and another one here these two are also equivalent, but they are different from this. So, they give rise to a triplet. So, here this coupling constant due to one pair is different quite different from the coupling constant to the other one. So, that is the way the spectrum looks like. So, this definitely shows that radical must be same. Oh, this is the only the possible radical that is consistent with the spectrum and knowing the chemical nature of the reactants nothing else can possibly give rise to similar EPR spectrum. So, the observation is therefore de very very definitive. Right. So, if instead of now this isopropanol if you take ethanol let us see what happens it will again looks that the similar pa pattern triplet triplet this triplet 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 triplet. So, this must be same radical as this one. But in addition, you see some smaller lines here. This one, this one, this one. So what are these things? So little hump is here. So here, then one can get some idea by measuring the relative heights of these intensities. So even if the one, now that I see little bit here, and gap between this and this is same as between this and this, and between this and this. So there should be 
a partner of this little line somewhere here which even if I do not see it I have to assume that it is there and the intensity ratios of this turns out to be 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. So, the sum of the radical is also found here along with this radical and knowing the again the whatsoever chemicals are there the most intelligent uh, guess will be that this corresponds to here. So, this is a sort of neutral semiconductor radical when OH is there when this dissociates to, to make it anion radical then it will have this one pair of protons and another pair of protons. Now, here because of the delocalization or four protons become equivalent and then I can get this sort of spectrum which is consistent with this. So, for isopropanol I get this radical only, but in ethanol this radical is predominantly seen, but this is also seen to a, to a certain extent. Another example here we use this acetone. plus isopropanol and sign light. So, by the way here the light that is used here that light is absorbed by this one this is the one which absorbs in your UV region this does not absorb. So, this goes to excite state and does photochemistry and produces this radical. Similarly, here this carbonyl group here of acetone that absorbs the UV light and that goes to excite a state and reacts with this and produces some radical and this is the result of that. So, here these lines are seen now 7 lines 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and if you see it is maybe it is not very perceptible, but they do not quite look like one transition there. This is what I discussed in one of the earlier uh, lectures is that one has to be careful that if there are overlap lines are there or not. So, here if one can see this sort of discontinuities are there. So, there is an indication that some other proton is also involved in coupling that. Of course, one can improve the resolution and uh, get a more direct evidence of that. So, here by after measuring the intensities of relative all the lines one gets this sort of numbers and that is consistent with 6 equivalent protons. And if you consider this little doublet, then the another proton which gives little small doublet, and the radical which is consistent with this EPR signal is this one. So, here so naturally here one can write the reaction mechanism that this excited state of this takes this hydrogen atom from here and produces this radical. It so happened that if you remove this hydrogen atom now, not the proton, so you bring it here, then this also becomes a free radical. So, two of this thing forms there. So, that is the way the steady state photolysis, and we can look at the uh, radical directly if, of course, the uh, circumstances are such that they are uh, favorable, then we can get this, this radical directly there. Of course, the condition for this is that we are doing the continuous photolysis by shining light all the time and detecting the spectrum. But radicals being short lived, they are also dying at the same time. So, whatever the steady state concentrations that are built up here, they will contribute to the observed spectrum. So, if the radicals do not have sufficient steady state concentration, it may be almost impossible to see the spectrum in this fashion. So, here comes the other technique that even if they do not live for a long time, if I allow the radicals to react with something else to produce some other radical and if that radical has sufficiently long lifetime, then we could probably detect those radicals, the secondary radicals and try to understand the reaction mechanism and probably make some guess about what the original radical that was. So, this technique is called spin trapping EPR, you trap the free radical. So, the idea is very simple that R is transient radical is some trapping agent. So, this reacts with this to give a another species which is trapped radical and this is 
has sufficient has long lifetime and may be easy, easier to detect. These are some common trapping agent and often they are the nitroso compound NO group. This is diamagnetic species, the radical comes here and attacks here to form a radical. This could presumably be should have sufficient long lifetime and easy to detect. Another one is of this kind. So, this radical comes and attacks here produce a radical of this kind. Then this could have a long lifetime then you can see it. So, so <coughs> one of the common trapping agent is this molecule called phenyl N butyl nitrone or called PBN. It is similar to this. So, phenyl group is here. So, for so here is the example for example that if ethyl radical is coming and attacking here then the radical that form is NO dot. So, what will be the EPS spectrum of that? This oxygen has the radical center, so ni nitrogen nearby. So, this will be triple triplet because of nitrogen spin 1, and then adjacent to that is this single proton which is coming from this trapping agent. So, that gives a doublet. This is a type of splitting one gets for this sort of trapped radical. And since the actual radical is sitting somewhere here, which is rather far from this uh, radical center this spectrum does not depend very much on the type of radical which is seen in the spectrum. So, it will often al almost always be a triplet and is split by doublet because of this one. There could be very small difference of the coupling constants here. Nevertheless, by and large all the trapped radical gives similar EPR spectrum. So, it is not a very characteristic evidence of what radical was trapped. All one can say is that some radical is trapped and one can think of uh, forming a reaction mechanism. There is another common trapping agent is called DMPO, this is structure of this. Now, here it is again same ethyl radical comes and attacks here this place. Then this is the trapped radical, this can be detected in EPR spectrum. And here again the radical center is near nitrogen, so this gives triplet uh, line. And then there is another proton here which also give a doublet, but here this spreading uh, constant due to this is somewhat more sensitive to the presence of this radical because it is very near that one. So, that is hydronic coupling constant of beta proton is reasonably sensitive to this. So, it will be easier to make better intelligent guess about the type of radical by seeing how much of this splitting constant has changed. Here is an example. The parabenzoquinone the same experiment that we did in the steady state one and we got only evidence of this uh, radical without having any knowledge of what the other radical was. Parabenzoquinone, ethanol and DMPO so it gives us some lines of this kind here. So, here you see this is doublet, some sort of doublet, some doublet may or may not be there, some you have to make some careful observation and, and see that these are the type signals coming from this adduct. This is the CH3, CH2O radical which ad, form an adduct with these two give a radical of this kind and other mm -hmm. one is this one when you use ethanol uh, sorry this is isopropanol. So, this splitting constant is it the this very large splitting constant uh, due to this for one trapped radical and somewhat smaller splitting constant due to this radical. So, this values I write here. Nitrogen spreading constant is 13.64 Gauss. This beta coupling constant and similarly duct width. Fourteen point eight zero Gauss and A is beta is equal to twenty one point 
zero cost. So here you see the difference in the high performing coupling because it is quite appreciable when this adduct uh, is formed and this adduct is formed. So that way DMPO is a much better uh, trapping agent for identifying the radical that is trapped there. But problem with spin trapping is that as I said earlier it is very difficult to often uh, identify the radical that is trapped unambiguously. Sometimes the trapping agent itself may react with the uh, light and then produce some radicals with solvent. And sometimes the trapped radical may not be the radical that one has in mind while formulating the reaction mechanism. And finally, even if the spin trapping technique yields no signal, it does not mean the radical is not forming. Finally, quickly go through this time resolved EPR spectroscopy where we try to capture the EPR spectrum of a radical which is right at the time of their formation and before they react. So, for that we use a usually pulse laser light or electron beam pulses and spectra are detected at different times after the generation radical. That is why it is called time resolved EPR. And naturally, it needs a fast response EPR spectrometer and a pulse source of light or electron because you have to compete with the reaction of the radical. So, this is the one uh, we I said earlier is that we use direct detection EPR spectrometer and we do not use the field modulation technique simply get the output from the preamplifier. But to improve the signal noise ratio we do signal averaging and, the, and so signal averaging is done in this way the suppose the laser is operated in repetitive mode and every time micro signal looks very similar. So, we try to get let us say a small portion of the voltage at a given time after the laser here given blue block here and average this many 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 times. There is a device called box car averager it its job is just that take a sample of the voltage at a given time and then average it out. So, if you plot this voltage at this time after the laser pulse while scanning the magnetic field I can get the time result repair spectrum of the species at this time after the laser pulse. Here is an example the duroquinone is dissolved in this triethylamine solvent and then a laser uh, UV laser light was shown on that and this is the type of radical spectrum I get. So, this corresponds to the duroquinone anion radical of this one. This is the duroquinone anion radical. The in here as I said earlier as a direct descent technique gives the absorption spectrum, but here the way we have adjusted the spectrometer that it is supposed to give the absorptive signal, but everything comes in the opposite direction. That is very strange that as if the signal is in the emissive form it is indeed very strange. So, we will not try to explore why it is so, but we will postpone it for later discussion. We can do another experiment that instead of getting the spectrum as a function of magnetic field, we can hold the magnetic field in any place we like and then see the micro signal as a function of time now and average the whole thing by using a very fast transient analog to digital converter. So, transient digital converter will capture the signal in digits at sort of sampling rate of certain given by the uh, user. So, this various digital values are added to generate the uh, average value of signal by adding several of these transients. So, here is an example. So, again duroquinone signal as a function of time it forms the negative direction again slowly goes to near 0. So, this time is of the order of few microseconds. If you increase this time to several hundred microseconds one can clearly see that signal uh, first starts emissive and then goes to absorptive and then goes to 0. So, presumably something is happening here and then radical is decaying in this fashion. So, this is the two dimensional spectrum one can create by getting similar spectrum at different magnetic field and, and so one axis magnetic field axis other time axis. So, the, the example that is saw earlier in the steady state photolysis acetone and isopropanol gives the absorptive spectrum of this kind this is the derivative signal but if we imagine that this is the way the absorptive signal is and this experiment using time visual spectroscopy gives completely different type of signal uh, intensities. This is steady state spectrum here the time visual spectrum you see how some of them are emissive some are absorptive and you doublet signals much seen much more clearly here. So, naturally something unusual information is contained in this time visual EPR spectroscopy. So, it seems the therefore, the, the spin population does not follow the Boltzmann distribution. Boltzmann distribution ensures the lower level are more popular than the higher level, but here things are all getting quite different. 
So, this set of information one can therefore, get in experiment of this kind and this phenomenon is called electron spin polarization. Right now, we simply learn that it is possible to detect such phenomenon and why it is so will therefore, involve a further discussion which will take up in a subsequent lecture.